Hi, so I'm um, Julia Chambers and I work in B1 with um, Marina and the, the gender team. So um, Danina has been through a lot, I think, of the, the processes in terms of carrying out a gender analysis, identifying how you're going to um, implement the work that you're doing, identifying indicators, etc. So I'm going to go through this quite quickly because we don't have much time left just to give you the kind of overall principles of the approach of how we're looking at measuring the impact of, um, of the work that we're doing on the gap and how that will affect the way that you design your own programs in whichever sector you, you fall. So um, can you skip to that? Sorry, we're having a technical problem here. Yeah, no. no. You don't think you've got the latest? You haven't got the latest version. Of it. It's fine. I'll while we wait for the slides to come up, I'll um, talk off my notes, and then hopefully the slides will will come up in due course. So, in terms of um, the reporting requirements and what it means for you as you sit in delegations or thematic units designing programs. The most important thing is what Verena has already been through is to carry out the gender analysis, which is now mandatory um, at all levels and will be reflected in the action document template and all the procedures here as well in terms of quality assurance. So once you've carried out that um, gender analysis, the indicator should be selected based on that. So it should reflect the findings of your gender analysis. So it's not enough to just do the analysis and then design your program independently, there should be some logic between the two. Um, and your intervention logic should reflect that, should reflect the findings of your analysis um, and how this, um, this has had an impact on the, the indicators that you've chosen to measure your progress. So that also, in turn, is going to have an impact on how you work with your implementing partners, um, making sure that they are aware of that, that you require this of them, that you require um, sex aggregated data and the measurement of those indicators. Um, you'll also need to make sure the data is obviously available and where it isn't, consider how the program itself may in fact generate um, the data. We'll also hear from HQ can provide you with um, quite a lot of support in terms of thinking through where you might find that data what type of statistics might help you, but also the types of indicators you could use, et cetera. So there will be some support from here. Um, in terms of, as Belina just went through, the quality assurance process here at HQ is going to reflect this, um, which means that when you design your programs and they come through QSG here, they're going to be assessed against gender analysis, indicators, the results that you're choosing. And if that's not deemed adequate, there could be delays in your programs being um, being approved. So it's in your own interest as well from a purely uh, procedural way to get this right early on. We, um, we're revising the checklist. We've, we've, in fact, revised the checklist already. It's up on the system. It's no longer a tick box exercise. So it's no longer good enough to just say, yes, we've done a gender analysis and leave it at that. We're asking much more in-depth questions along the lines of, okay, so you've done your analysis, what were the results, how has this um, impacted the design of your project, how has this had an effect on the indicator that you're choosing, and where it's been not relevant, how are you making sure that you are, at the very least, doing no harm in your project, so you're not putting women in a situation of um, greater insecurity. Um, again, as Ready now went through. We are looking now at the action document template. There is an updated one, but we're looking um, at it in slightly more depth. Yeah, thanks. Can I click through this or yeah? Um, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So we're um, we're also looking at the action document template, making sure that gender doesn't just remain in that box about cross-cutting issues, but is actually integrated throughout the whole um, the whole action document. And we're also looking at the guidance that accompanies that, and the QSG checklist itself. So not just the gender one, but the actual one that the QSG uses in going through your action documents. So all this to say that you know the procedures here are going to reflect um, what we've um, 
what we're asking of in, in the gap and the chain and the the type of analysis that Clarina has been through that we expect of programs in whichever sector they form. Um, and the the logic behind this is that we also here at um, headquarters level want to be able to assess how well we're doing on gender equality. So we've suggested indicators in the gap, thematic indicator, indicators that are aligned with the EU results framework. They're also um, aligned with the proposed SDGs. And the reason we've done this is that where they're applied to your work, if you could select those, that would be ideal because we can then aggregate those results and we can get an indication here of how well we're doing on a more global um, scale. However, we also recognize that in some contexts, some projects, the indicators we've suggested may not be relevant, and that's absolutely fine. Again, if based on your analysis, you find that there are other indicators that are more appropriate to measuring your progress, those can also be selected. And then it's our job here at HQ to you know, figure out how we aggregate those with others and how we come up with an overall picture. Um, I'm not sure whether you're aware, but the minimum requirement for delegations is that they report against at least one objective per thematic area. So that selection will be made by delegations by mid-2016, and therefore your new actions, any new programs that you're developing, and those results will be contributing to that. So ideally you will be using gender sensitive indicators and we'll be able to measure those results and they will be um, able to contribute to your EU delegation's um, commitments on the gap. So the way we're um, asking for the reporting to take place on the thematic indicators is as light touch as we can make it. We've, um, we're basically piggybacking off the EU results framework um, in order to streamline the reporting and to um, and to make sure that we embed gender across the way the EC works. So all of these indicators will, uh, when your project comes to an end, will be reported by the end of project results reporting. They will be gathered through that process, whether they are EU results, um, framework results or not. They all results will be gathered through that process and we will then again be able to mine that data here at HQ level and get a sense of how we're doing. Um, so, yeah, all that to say that basically the EU results framework is going to be our, our procedure to gather the results and we're not coming up with a whole separate way of measuring um, gender results. Um, so, and I've said this before, the idea is that over time we develop this body of indicators um, that we can aggregate. Now, the issue we have though is that obviously this is for all new actions. It's those new actions that are, um, as from January 2016, should include gender sensitive indicators and the analysis. And then as we go through the EU results framework, it will, the results will only be measured at the end of your action. So there's going to be um, quite a long time lapse in a way between, you know, the, the progress itself will take time to, to be visible and to be assessed. So in terms of your own programs, again, this goes back to the importance of ongoing monitoring and being able to, you know, be it on an annual or 18 monthly basis, get a sense of how you're progressing independently of the results framework measurement. Um, and again, that will be important in terms of contributing to your overall EU delegation's performance on, on gender and on the gap. Um, so I won't go through this again. I mean, it's what we've just been through. The gender analysis is absolutely essential and the sex aggregated data is also a requirement um, of the gap. Now, Marina's touched on this a, a little bit and Verena has as well. All of this, the, um, the results measurement, the quality of the proposals going through the QSG, the use of the DAC um, gender marker, et cetera, form part of the criteria that we've developed and which is set out in the gap to measure the performance of individual delegations um, and thematic areas. So performance will be tracked, the delegations will be ranked and where poor performance is identified, it will be challenged in some way. Um, we're considering more positive responses to poor performance in terms of providing additional support rather than looking at you know 
um, more negative responses. We're also looking at mechanisms or ways of rewarding good practice. Um, we're also considering potentially rewards for individual performance, so not just how a delegation is doing, but where particular individuals are really playing a key role in, in pushing this forward. We're looking at how they might also get some recognition. So um, the deputy, uh, sorry, the DG is um, currently considering this and looking at different suggestions that we've put forward to him, and he will probably outline those in his video message to heads of delegations um, in the next few months. So again, this is to say that you know even if what you're doing may seem quite um, separate from this process, it actually does feed it. Your your actions, your gender analysis, the indicators that you use, the results that you contribute to are feeding this wider process and will be contributing to the overall performance of your delegations um, against this. Um, sorry, there's a question from James. Hi, James. Uh, can you remind us what happens if actually like Okay, so this is down to the QSG, and um, as I've said, we're reviewing the checklist that the QSG itself uses, so they will have quite um, clear indications on what is deemed good enough and not, and it will be assessed at their level. Obviously, B1 is going to play an incredibly important role in this, um, and hopefully the future help desk as well in looking at all these action documents as they come through and in going back to delegations and asking them to make um, the necessary changes where needed. So there will be a delay in the approval. And it will be down to, to B1 and directorate, B2 in general, our director, to keep an eye on that and to make sure that we are systematically doing that um, and that you know in the longer term there's a change in the way that delegations do their analysis and, and push those forward. Medina's coming in. If I may just uh, complete Julia's reply, there has already been uh, uh, situations in which the geographical director has been uh, particularly attentive, and speaking about Carla Montesi, for instance, or Kundun, they have been extremely attentive to the gender impact of whatever program was under discussion, and then they themselves, they ask for better information about that. So is, as I said at the beginning, the leadership, so the top management is really on board. And even because they are very much pushed by member states, for instance, the program committee of the ACP, ADF, uh, dealing with all the ACP countries, uh, have been uh, several times asking uh, what is done to implement gender equality in the program uh, promoted, promoted and funded by the ADF. So we have a very, very strong ally this time, and uh, <laughs> we will, uh, we, I hope this will work uh, to, to, to make uh, the gender equality be mainstreamed everywhere. I pass the floor to Benedetta now. Uh, sorry, there is a question. Would the gender focal point in UD have specific support from B1? Yes, yes, in UD, yes, of course. We are there at their disposal for any kind of support uh, we can uh, we can provide, of course. I will tell you more about which kind of support we are planning to give. Um, it will be my last uh, intervention, so I leave the floor to Benedetta now. Thank you.